Hello, and welcome to this episode of the ASHA podcast. I'm Fred Wyant with the American Sexual Health Association, ASHA. September is Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month. We focus primarily on cervical cancer, of course, but we're expanding our horizons. And we're going to talk today with Helen Epstein, a journalist and author of several books, including Getting Through It, My Year of Cancer During COVID, in which she chronicles her experiences of being diagnosed with endometrial cancer in the midst of a COVID epidemic. So Helen Epstein, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Nice to meet you. It's lovely. So tell us something about yourself. I've got the skinny. You were born in Prague grew up in New York, and you're pretty much alive for the journalism field. You've been clacking on a typewriter or a keyboard since college, right? Right, right. I've been a journalist for 50 years. I'm now 74, and um, I've been writing for 50 years, which is kind of amazing to me. Um, I love writing. I really enjoy every aspect of journalism, and I think being a journalist helped me a great deal when I had endometrial cancer. Mm, all right. Well, let's get right to it then. So tell us how this began. What, what led to your diagnosis? Well, I live in Boston, which many of your viewers know or your listeners know is a research hub. And it's a research hub for many things. And of course, it was one of the places that COVID exploded early on. In February of 2020, there was a Biogen conference here. And as a result of that conference, COVID surged. Um, As a result, many people in my area canceled all their medical appointments. I canceled my eye appointments, my dental appointments, all of us panicked. Um, And uh, so one of the things I canceled was a uterine sonogram, which I had been having over 30 years to follow my fibroids. And I just thought it wasn't a big deal. I had never had any problems. So what was the big deal? So COVID broke out in March of of 2020. And all of a sudden in May of 2020, I noticed some blood in my panties. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, this does not look good. Um, Even though there's COVID, I better go see my OBGYN. So I called my OBGYN. She said, get here immediately. I went to see her. Um, She did an ultrasound. Then she did a biopsy and she discovered that I had endometrial cancer. So I'm curious, what was it like getting appointments, medical appointments during COVID? Was, I mean, were you able to get in when you needed to or did you really have to- It was unbelievably easy because everybody canceled their appointments. The medical facilities were desolate. The highways were desolate. I was often the only person in the waiting room And everything happened so quickly that I actually had none of the anxiety that most cancer patients have because there was almost no waiting for appointments and there was very little waiting for results as well. So between the time I was diagnosed and the time I had my surgery, uh, there elapsed maybe one month and that was filled with all kinds of stuff I had to do. Um, you know, you have to get a port, you have to get all kinds of um, exams. Uh, And so I was really busy. But it was a very peculiar kind of busy, because going in and out of the city, in and out of Boston, and in and out of all of these mental uh, uh, health institutions, um, it was it was very eerie. Everything looked like an Edward Hopper painting. Everything was totally, totally desolate. And also uh, you could not bring anyone with you. No significant others, no sisters, no mothers, no nothing. So I was going in and out of these places by myself, masked. I was interacting with people who were both masked and often on top of that had a plastic shield on top. Sure. It was extremely eerie. Wow, it had to be, uh, uh, yeah, almost something dystopian in a way, like people are just like, like they're in hazmat suits almost. Right. Yeah. So, all right. So when you first heard the word cancer, um, this, what was your reaction like? Well, I was kind of taken for a loop. Nobody in my family had had cancer. Um, my mother didn't have cancer. 
Um, and uh, I had never thought about having cancer. I, I thought that in my family, the killer was heart disease mm -hmm. and that I was going to, my father had died of the third of three heart attacks. And I was sure I was going to die of a heart attack, but that's not what happened. So when I got the cancer diagnosis, I kind of thought, holy cow, um, what now? Like many American women, of course, I had many, many friends who had had breast cancer, but I didn't know anybody who had had GYN cancer. Mm. Yeah, we actually hear that a lot. Um, some of the feedback we get from, uh, we, we, as part of our organization, we have uh, the National Cervical Cancer Coalition. The chapters, local chapters are primarily run by survivors for patients and uh, we hear something like that a lot. Like I'm the only one you know, I've ever known, you know, in my circle who, who's had this. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a sense of isolation to it. Um, but there's another thing too. I mean, over the last two decades, breast cancer has really become a subject of public conversation. You know, everybody knows the pink ribbons, everybody knows the marathons, all of the different fundraisers. Everybody talks about breast cancer a lot. You know, people have opinions about whether they should have reconstructive surgery or whether they should have a double mastectomy. I mean, all kinds of people discuss this who've never had breast cancer. On the other hand, there's very, very little talked about gynecological cancer. And I'm not sure why that is. Part of the reason I think is because it's not visible. It is interior, it is inside you. You don't really know what it is, where it is, how it feels. That's one idea. The second idea, of course, is it has to do with your genitals and it has to do with your uterus. And in the American puritanical culture, that has always been a no-no. You don't talk about your uterus, you don't talk about your vagina, you don't talk about uh, your vulva. So there's no obvious um, public forum for a discussion of gynecological cancer. I, I think you've hit on really the, the key there. Um, uh, it is, yeah, it, this is a taboo to topic. It has to do with down there. You know, right. and in some, and in some way, S E X, you know, so yeah, we don't, we're not comfortable talking about that. We don't really have a lot of models, I think, to talk about that. Um, you know, we, and I think the other thing too, is that with, with some other cancers, it's fairly easy to find champions or spokespeople, celebrities who I've had this come out and then they come in and talk about it. Not so much so with uh, gynecologic cancer, even with cervical cancer, um, you know, you don't really have those those public facing champions quite the way you do, I think with some other, it was Correct. Some, some other you know, cancer. So there you go. Um, so you, as part of your treatment, you really hit the trifecta. You had surgery, chemo and radiation. So I wanna ask you just about coping with that. I mean, how did you manage the side effects? Well, um, one, the, the, big, the big envelope that all of this happened in was during COVID. And of course, it's hard to remember now that we have vaccines and we have Paxlovid, how everybody felt back in 2020 when nobody knew what this illness was and nobody knew what the cure was. So I was more afraid of dying of COVID than I was of cancer. Sure. Cancer after all had been around for a really long time and it had been studied for a really long time. So I didn't think that much about, about um, fear of cancer. However, I was afraid of pain. Um, I had read, as a journalist, I, I'm a big reader, and I had read lots of books about people who had cancer, and I had seen movies. And the two that stuck in my mind for GYN cancer were Gilda Radner's memoir that she wrote in 1989 about dying of um, ovarian cancer. And the second, um, the second piece of art was a film called Wit, which was a play and a television movie with Emma Thompson um, about an English professor who went through tons of chemo for ovarian cancer and really suffered. Mm -hmm. And the double whammy of these two things, Gilda Radner and Wit, really threw me for a loop. And I was terrified of both chemo and radiation. I wasn't that scared of surgery because um, I had a wonderful doctor and 
one of the great things I have to say about the Boston area is that so many of the doctors are women and so many of the doctors were about my generation or maybe within a 10 year radius of my age. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I was speaking with people who really understood me. And I felt absolutely able to ask any question I wished. And also because I was a journalist, I was used to asking the questions I wished. Sure. So the first hurdle um, was the diagnosis. And the diagnosis um, was not fabulous. Um, they don't know the stage when they first do a biopsy, but they do know the kind of cancer it is. And the kind of cancer I had was um, number three, which my surgeon explained to me was an extremely sneaky, malicious kind of cancer, which was endometrial cancer, but it resembled ovarian cancer in the way that it behaved. That did not make me happy, of course, because I immediately saw Gilda Radner and I thought, okay, that's not good. But she told me surgical techniques had improved so much over that time period since 1989 that I would have microscopic um, robotic surgery and that my incisions would be really small and that it re the surgery would really not be a big deal. Now, I didn't know how much to believe that, but I decided to believe her. And in fact, the surgery was the least difficult part of it. I had five small incisions. Um, I did not need prescription drugs after the surgery and I was walking around the next day. So that was great. Um, the chemo was something else. Mm -hmm. I had to have six cycles of chemo. They were quite um, challenging. I knew uh, I was really prepared for them. Everybody told me what to expect. Everybody told me that, again, the medications had been improved over the last two decades and I would not be having the kind of nausea that the people I had read about had had. I would have no pain, but I would be totally, totally challenged and I would feel as though I were dying. And that was true. That's how I felt. Um, so I had six, uh, I had five cycles of chemo. During the first cycle of chemo, I had two strokes. Um, mm. They don't really know how that happened, but they do know that there is a correlation between GYN cancer and stroke. And um, apparently what happened with me was that I had a blood clot and uh, it went to my brain. And so in the middle of my chemo, I got hauled off to the emergency oh, yes. room with a stroke. So I had a very, very eventful chemo. Um, I have to say my doctors were unbelievable. Um, they were, there was a 24 seven hour emergency line, which um, they urged me to make use of. They made, sure that I understood, since I'm a kind of um, person who doesn't like to ask for help, to ask for help whenever I had the slightest question. And after they pushed me to do that a couple of times, I did that. Um, it's very hard for a lot of people to ask for help and especially to approach something like a 24 seven emergency line. You kind of think, well, I'm not dying, so why would I call the emergency right. line? But the fact is during COVID, you can't really go to the ER every time you want. So you have to use the emergency line. And I did use the emergency line and it was very helpful. I also really talked to my nurses. I can't emphasize enough how important the nurses were. Um, nurses are like the foot soldiers of the health system. And they are always there. I find them superbly well-informed, intelligent, helpful, and mostly because you spend hours getting these infusions, they're around and you can ask them anything you want and you can get a lot of answers. And that was hugely helpful to me. So um, I had these wonderful women doctors who I felt were approachable. I had 
fabulous nurses and I had a fabulous support staff. I was at Massachusetts General Hospital. And the thing about that place is everybody is really happy to be there. So there's, there's no attitude problem with anybody. Everybody is there really to help you and to make things easier. So I would say that the chemo um, was as good as it could be. The fifth cycle was so difficult for me. I felt like I was so worn out. I, again, no pain, no nausea, but I really thought I was going to just keel over and kick off. And I said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And I, and I was also getting a little bit of neuropathy in my feet. Mm -hmm. And because I'm a writer, I was really worried about getting neuropathy in my fingers, which I really didn't want to get. So I called my doctor and I said, hey, how important is it that we do six? Could we stop at five? And she said, yeah, I think that's a good idea given the givens. So that ended chemo. Um, that took 18 weeks. I had them every three weeks. Um, I was supposed to have six, six of them. I had five, so 15 weeks. And um, my chemo was to be followed by radiation. Now, of course, I'm skipping over the day-to-day -day of this. The day-to-day -day of this was unbelievable. Luckily, it was the summer, so I could convalesce outside. I set up a chaise outside under the trees in my front lawn. And my husband would come out and force feed me um, liquids every hour. Cause one of the things you're supposed to do and nobody ever does enough of is hydrate enough. Mm -hmm. So he would bring out fluids and popsicles. And then because it was COVID was still a novelty and everybody was cooped up at home, people would come visit me out on the lawn and of course they would bring cakes and cookies. So that part was wonderful for me. I had a really good social time. Um, and that kind of was over by the fall here in New England because then it got cooler. And then the next stage was radiation. So radiation, I being a child of the sixties who, um, learned about mushroom clouds and hid under my desk for air raid drills. Mm -hmm. I had a totally irrational fear of radiation. For me, radiation was the atomic bomb, um, Chernobyl, sure. Three Mile Island, and x-rays all rolled up into one. And I just said, uh, all of a sudden, I had been so compliant until then, and suddenly I became super stubborn, and I said, I'm not having radiation. Mm. And unfortunately, even though my doctors were terrific, there are always communication glitches because you're dealing with so much information when you enter the cancer tunnel. And I had somehow missed the fact that brachytherapy, which is a kind of targeted radiation, goes hand in hand with the chemo and sometimes even precedes the chemo. But somehow in all the massive information I was assimilating, I didn't get this. And I got totally stuck on arguing with my doctors about why I didn't wanna have radiation, which was kind of nuts, but that's where I was. And after a while, my doctor seemed to understand what the problem was and we got it straightened out and I decided to have uh, brachytherapy. Now, brachytherapy is not very, uh, none of this stuff is very appetizing, but the brachytherapy is really kind of crummy. I mean, it's like getting a dynamite stick put into your vagina. They call it a lead tampon. So it's like putting a tampon into yourself, but it's hard. And then that tampon is attached to a robot and that robot is attached to a radioactive um, machine. And when you have this brachytherapy done, it's done in the basement of a hospital and there has to be a physicist around in addition to the doctor because they're dealing with radioactive material. So it's pretty creepy. I mean, even if you didn't grow up in the 60s, it's pretty creepy. Right. 
and you're alone in this room with this little robot between your legs. And um, it doesn't last very long. The treatments, there are only about three or four treatments um, in the particular kind I got, and they only last about eight minutes, but they're incredibly tense because you've got to have the physicist there. In my case, one day the physicist didn't turn up. We had to wait for the physicist and I got left alone in this room. Mm -hmm. And then other times you just don't know what's going on because you're alone in this room and you've got this thing between your legs and you're thinking, is it on, is it off, what's going on? So it's pretty creepy. But in again, in terms of pain, in terms of nausea, zero. So that was actually a big nothing. It was just psychological. Of course. Yeah. And when I listened to you describe that, I mean, the last time I had to have dental x-rays, I got a little bit anxious about that. And then compared to what you're describing there, I, I can see it. And, uh, you know, you brought up an interesting point I'd never thought about that there could be a generational thing about radiation and what that triggers. It makes perfect sense right. when I hear you explain it. And I, I never thought about that before. Yeah, yeah, you're thinking well, about- Well, you know, the whole meltdowns. thing, different people have different psychological triggers. Radiation happened to be my trigger. But as I was going through the process, again, as a journalist, I kept thinking, well, what, what would, how would I feel if I were gay? How would I feel if I had a domestic abuser at home? How would I feel if I had been sexually abused as a child? And there are triggers for all of these things during the process. So after the brachytherapy, this is the radiation therapy, one of the side effects is that your vagina shrinks and um, it becomes less um, flexible and um, they have a protocol where they basically give you what looks like a dildo mm -hmm. fitted to you. And for about six months, you have to use the dildo to make sure that your vagina doesn't contract and that it doesn't dry up like a raisin pretty much. Now, for some reason, in addition to the radiation, I found this terribly, terribly upsetting. Um, I don't think I'm a prude, on the other hand, I had never sat with a nurse and this very strangely colored dildo and talked about how to exercise my vagina every night. Huh? And I really hated it. I didn't like having it at home. I didn't want my husband to see it. I didn't want our cleaning lady to see it. I, I hit it. Sure. And the whole thing was just horrible for me. It's funny because, you know, you think on the one hand you have cancer and you should be happy you didn't die. You're happy that you didn't have complications. And here you are fussing about a dildo, but that's what I was doing. I really, really didn't like it. And I write about all that so you can, you can read about it. I also, I'm not used to discussing my sexual life with strangers. Um, my sexual life is my business and my husband's business. Um, I don't want to share it with anyone. Mm -hmm. And here I was being asked questions every time I went to a follow-up about my sexual life. And I finally said to them, look, um, it's really not something I want to discuss with you. If I want to discuss it, if it's a problem, I will. And so that's the way we left it. But again, I thought about lots of things. I thought not only about all these triggers for various women, but I thought about how different this experience is depending on what age you are um, and also what stage in life you are. I mean, here I was a grandmother who had been married to the same guy, I'd been sleeping with the same guy for 40 years. Um, you know, sex was not something that was like the, I don't know, the centerpiece of our relationship. You know, we had we have lots of other things in our relationships besides sex, including two grandchildren and two children and God knows how many nieces and nephews and an intellectual life and a, and a travel life. But imagine, I thought, if you were 30 and you had this and that you didn't, you weren't dating, you were looking to be dating. Or imagine if you were 40 and you had an active sexual life with your husband and two small kids, how would you be coping with this? 
suppose you were 50 and um, all of a sudden you were thrown into instant menopause when they removed your um, uterus. How do you cope with that? So it's, I was very aware that my experience was only one of many possible experiences. And while they all have something in common, they all are special in their own way. So let me, this is a good time to ask about your husband, Patrick. Yeah. Because um, cancer is something that affects the family just in general, but you're right, you're talking about a gynecologic cancer. There could be some relationship issues that go into it. There's just a lot to think about. But in general, how, how did how did your husband cope with this? My husband was absolutely unbelievable. And I really had no way of knowing that before. You know, all of us, when we get married, take vows and you say for better or worse and worse in sickness and in health. And you don't really, you never really think through what that will really mean. And this really meant that he was hauling me out of the bathtub sometimes because I didn't have enough strength to get out of the bathtub by myself. Um, he was feeding me. He was making sure I took my pills. He was driving me back and forth to the hospital. And I suppose most severely for him, he was sitting across the breakfast table for me when I had a stroke. So he had PTSD, I didn't really have PTSD because I was so busy getting through it that I didn't have any energy to observe it or to remember it. I don't remember my stroke at all. The last thing I remember is some big guy coming into my office and tying me to a chair and hauling me out. But then I remember nothing. My husband remembers everything. He remembers me being loaded into the ambulance. He, he remembers going to the hospital and trying to find me. You know, he, so he has PTSD. And I think that what maybe the most important choice you make after you choose a doctor is choose who will be your companion through this cancer tunnel. Um, some people choose their husbands or their significant others, but other people who I know have told me um, their husband couldn't do it or their significant other couldn't do it. And they were much better off choosing a sister, a daughter, a mother, um, even in one case, a housekeeper whom they had been very close to for many years. So the question of who accompanies you through this is really important. And it's not obvious. It's not always the significant other. So that brings uh, me to what I like to call my pearls of wisdom section of the podcast, where I want to get your insights, um, like a couple of quick takeaways uh, for people who are just starting this journey, but and uh, certainly from the patient side. But let's stick let's stick with a partner and what you said. Who's going to be your companion, and how do we support them? So for loved ones who are going through this with a patient, for someone like 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 your husband or or anyone who's the companion. What do, they, what do they need to know? How can we really support them so that they're taking care not only of the patient, but themselves? I think what's really important is to do a self-assessment and figure out what you need. Really be honest with yourself, figure out what you need, and then ask people for it, including your significant other. Say, look, this is what I need. I don't need you to hover over me, but I need you to check in if that's what you need. Or um, what I told friends, please don't ask questions and don't give unsolicited advice. I will ask you if I have a question for you. If not, just show up for me, send me emails, divert me, entertain me, bring me good things to eat, lots of chocolate, mm. but don't bother me, don't, and I tried to say this as nicely as I could, but I really wanted to make clear that we had as much medical information as we needed. We didn't need any more. And I really needed their company. I didn't need their advice. Um, in the case of my husband, I tried to tell people, 
to take care of him as well as me. <laughs> and particularly with food because he is absolutely useless in the kitchen. So one of the big asks that we made was for people to bring us food and they did, they brought us wonderful food. Yeah. So that was good. Did, uh, did, did your husband ever like say, just take a day off, maybe somebody would spend time with you and he would go to the movies or to a walk in the park. Did he do anything like that for self-care? Well, we do have a dog and we do live right next to a woods. So he was, he would go for a walk three times a day. Um, he would never leave me alone unless I had the phone and he would take the phone with him. He was always in electronic touch with me, which is something that only, you know, we can only do now. We certainly couldn't have done this 20 years ago with the phone situation, but um, he really didn't want time off. He took it on a daily basis. And one of the great things about having a pet, I can't tell you this enough, is that pets are tremendous diversions, both for the person who's sick and for the caretaker, because there's no question about it. I mean, you have to take the pets out from walk every day and you have to move. And that's really important. I also had many friends. Um, I went to an all girls high school. And so I got in touch with our listserv when I was diagnosed and about 30% of them had already had cancer. Most of them again had had breast cancer rather than um, GYN cancer, but they all gave me their health tips. And one of their health tips was no matter how wretched you feel, you must force yourself to walk every day. So sometimes I would walk with my husband arm in arm around the house because I couldn't go any further, you know, like the second or third day after chemo. But then I would walk a mile a day with my husband very slowly, but we, we would walk. So um, there, we were pretty good about caring for our health. You know, we, 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 we got all of these good tips and we did pay attention to them. So that was good. But I have to say at the end of all this, I'm now two years out of this. I'm fine. I don't have PTSD, but my husband does. And every time he doesn't know where I am exactly, or if I'm acting a little weird, if I'm tired or if I don't look right, he immediately starts getting anxious. Of course, yeah, it's hard to let go of that, right? I can see that. Uh, it's so I never that's perspective uh, that I wouldn't have had that you don't have the the this, the, the lingering trauma, but he does, yeah, and I can absolutely see. Yeah, I mean, caregivers are under so much stress with this, um, and and it, and you, I I I I'm appreciate that you're bringing up the fact that it lingers even even once you're not worried about the day to day grind of cancer care. Right. There's, there's still a lot going on. Uh, right, and the other thing is that you have to remember that people are different. People are just very different. Some people are extroverted. Some people are introverted. Some people obsess about things. Some people don't. Some people are very anxious and some people just space out. Now, for better or worse, my husband and I are very different in that way. He's extremely anxious. He's anxious about everything. I am extremely unanxious. I don't think about things. I um, deflect, I divert, I put my attention elsewhere. And that is sometimes very difficult for him. Mm. All right, so let me ask you here, You've, taught, you've got a patient who's just newly diagnosed with endometrial or some other gynecologic cancer, just starting this journey. What's your advice, your two or three essential takeaways they really need to know? I think the first thing is find a doctor who you really feel comfortable with. And the way you do that, I think, is you ask around for a recommendation or you go to your nearest university or college gynecological cancer department and get recommendations. And if you don't like the first person you see, see a second or even see a third, because that person is going to be the most important person for you. And you have to feel totally comfortable with that person. If you don't, it will make your whole experience utterly miserable. So that's number one. Um, number two, I would say, don't 
read absolutely everything online about your cancer because you'll go out of your mind. There are millions of hits about cancer. I would either choose one or two people who've been through it before you and interview them and hear what they have to say because they will give you a kind of tour guide experience of what to expect. You don't need to know every statistic. You don't need to know the odds of this or that. And um, it's not gonna help you. What's gonna help you is for you to make a plan and stick to it. So I would say, don't go on a treasure hunt on the internet, just, you'll have plenty to deal with just with the information that your doctor gives you. And then the third thing I would say with your friends is really take a good look at your friends and see who's gonna be really good in this situation and who will help you. And from whom do you feel comfortable accepting help? Because a lot of people have trouble accepting help. And um, I, I really didn't, I, I felt comfortable asking for what people could do. And if they could do it, that was great. If they couldn't do it, too bad. But um, I, I, I felt like I had a really good experience with my friends. They, they really did come through for me. And the ones who didn't come through for me, too bad. Where can listeners connect with you and get your book? book? Oh, thank you. Um, well, uh, my book is on Amazon. It comes in three forms. You can get it as an audio book if you like the sound of my voice and you can hear me talk to you, or you can get it as a Kindle book, or you can get it as a paperback book. And I'd love it if you reviewed it on Amazon and I'd love it if you told your friends about it. <laughs> there you go. And your website. My website's very easy. It's helenepstein.com. All right, and we will link to that and also to your Amazon page in the show notes. So intrepid listener, just go back to where you found this episode. You'll, you'll see all the links at the bottom. All right, Helen Epstein, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, this was illuminating in a lot of ways. You really brought up things I had not thought about, different triggers, and you're right, everybody's different. Um, there's just a lot to, to, to process there, but you laid it out perfectly. Thank you so much. It, it was lovely to be having a chance to speak with you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Bye-bye. Oh. Hope to see you sometime in North Carolina. Yes. The next <laughs> time, if you're down here, you let us know. And to all the listeners, thank you so much. You're the reason we do this, so you keep checking back, and we'll have more episodes and resources like this one coming out and send us feedback info at ashasexualhealth.org until next time take care everybody bye